Well, good evening and welcome to the Combined Local Churches Forum. We are meeting in the Raymer Family Church Auditorium in Springwood. And uh, tonight we are going to be covering uh, some candidate questions for the candidates for Springwood and uh, also Mansfield, two of the must-win seats for any party. This election. My name's Dave Pello, and uh, I'm from an organisation called Church and State. And uh, part of that ministry is to help Christians be better informed and better involved in politics. Uh, the, our MC for this evening is Wendy Francis, the Queensland and Northern Territory Director of the Australian Christian Lobby. Uh, and ACL have been very instrumental in helping organise tonight. And uh, we also have a bunch of local pastors and Christians from churches in the area who are interested in interviewing candidates for representation in the next Queensland Parliament. And we've got about 120 or so uh, people in the audience tonight. Welcome. Our most important VIPs tonight uh, are voters, in my estimation. Uh, democracy means rule of the people. Uh, minister means servant. So it's actually the voters who are the most important people uh, here tonight, in my opinion. And a big thank you to our candidates who have put their hand up and volunteered to serve the people in the Parliament of Queensland. It's a brave volunteer for a huge chunk of your life, your privacy, and uh, I think um, under-remunerated. Um, the, the reward is, is the service and, and results itself. But I'm just going to speak for a few minutes, very short few minutes, before we get into the evening, about how a Christian should regard politics. There's a bit of a uh, postmodern interpretation of Scripture, which is fairly unique to the West, which seems to sometimes think that church should be separated from the state. But that, in fact, is a very novel interpretation of Scripture, not how one should read the Gospels. In fact, when the first Christians were baptised in the name of Jesus, they were baptised confessing Jesus is Lord. And that was an act of sedition in ancient Rome. The government at that time demanded worship of Caesar. And to say anyone other than Caesar was Lord was to defy the civil authorities. And so the Christians were very, very political in so much of what they did. And when Jesus taught us to pray, he taught us to pray, uh, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's my opinion that when we vote and when we as Christians engage with the public square, it's not to seek power for ourselves. It's not to seek uh, pork barrelling and favours for our hip pocket. It's actually for love of neighbour. That's the right motivation to be engaging with the public square. That's the right paradigm with which to interview candidates who are seeking to represent us in Parliament. And so we need to then go as undecided uh, voters to each candidate and sincerely interview them for the job. Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, was, was asked, Mr. Lincoln, uh, is God on your side? And Abraham Lincoln said, I'm far less concerned 
whether God is on my side than with am I on God's side. And we see this wisdom didn't start with Abraham Lincoln, but actually in the book of Joshua, chapter 3, he's an army man. He's a soldier. He's general of the Israeli army, and he's outside Jericho preparing for an invasion, seriously on a hostile war footing. And he's outside the camp, away from the safety of reinforcements and and backup, and he sees an armed man, a stranger standing uh, nearby. Must have snuck up on him. And we can imagine his guns pointed, but obviously in, in the times of ancient Israel, it was a sword. So he sees this armed man and he basically asks the sensible question every soldier should ask, friend or foe, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the man unhelpfully said, no, I'm not for you or for your enemies. I'm the commander of the Lord's host. And, and so Joshua, very much like Abraham Lincoln, says, well, I'm not on anybody's side. I'm on your side. He bows down and he worships God And he says, um, tell me what you want me to do. Speak, because I'm listening. I'm paying attention. You're in charge. That's the right posture for a Christian to bring to an election. Not, I'm a loyal voter to any particular party or person. And so I encourage you in this election and every election to sincerely um, swear your loyalty to God. It's a safe place to put your trust, a safe place to look for direction and wisdom for the election, for what our society needs. The most benefit, the most justice. And here's the thing about God. He's not interested or or particularly biased towards democracy or monarchy or dictatorship or even theocracy. What he's absolutely wanting in every government is justice. He's wanting wisdom. He's wanting mercy, and he's wanting peace for our neighbours. That's what we're interviewing our candidates for. Will you be able to provide in Parliament justice, wisdom, mercy, and peace? And so we've got some some questions that, uh, you know, you'll have some questions, and and we as people of God have questions so that we can see for our neighbours' benefit, not for power, but for our neighbours' blessing, Five, more than five million people in Queensland who we can benefit with good stewardship of our vote in this election. What we want to see from them is policies that line up with God's word when God's word is black and white. Now, there are some things God's word is not black and white on, like how many lanes should be on the freeway on the Bruce Highway. You could argue on perhaps the liberal side, we need to not encroach any further on nature but you could probably argue on the more conservative side yes but we need more time with our families and less time on the road so allow room for some disagreement where biblical wisdom applies but not necessarily biblical authority that's how we can find unity even when we disagree politically we say our unity is in Jesus and our authority our appeal to authority is the word of God And let's pursue truth together. That way, you actually do me a favor if you persuade me I'm wrong. Because I'm relieved of the burden of ignorance and I get the asset of truth. Do me the favor and come and have a conversation with me if you sincerely think I'm wrong and there's some wisdom, facts and evidence that I'm missing. So that's the kind of spirit we bring to a political debate. We want to pursue truth robustly and we want to see God's word. uh, Look, there's no black and white about some issues. What God has designed is very, very clear, such as family, such as marriage, such as the sanctity of life. Um, but we then ask the candidates, will you represent those things? And, and when more than one or two candidates are prepared to be uh, faithfully representing what we... And there's many constituencies they've got to represent, so we've just got to make our case like everybody else um, and say our vote will follow a certain number of deal-breaker questions, and when we can't split the pack, there'll come some secondary issues. There's lots of important issues. But that's the spirit we want to approach tonight with, that we are interviewing candidates for a very important job for the sake of blessing our neighbours, bearing in mind, first of all, where God's Word speaks authoritatively on some things, and secondly, where there's biblical wisdom um, with which we can have a productive debate thereafter. Does that sound good?
Well, given we're all Christians, why don't we open this evening um, with a word of prayer, asking God to bless and guide us. Dear Jesus, um, we just live to see your kingdom, like you prayed, to come here and now for the benefit and blessing of our neighbours. Let your will be done. Uh, and we pray that wisdom would be multiplied here. Help us to discover truth, not any individual human agenda, but your plans and your desires for the best outcomes for Queensland at this election. And may your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like to welcome to be the MC for this evening's um, ceremonies, uh, the Queensland and Northern Territory Director of the Australian Christian Lobby, Wendy Francis. Thank you very much. And hi, everybody. I'm sorry I was late. Did Dave explain? I was on Bolt. Um, so uh, it's very hard to tell him to hurry up. It's not the sort of man you can tell. But it was really funny because as I was um, answering questions, there were questions coming through on this phone already for tonight. And I was really tempted to look. And I was thinking, no, I can't. That'll distract me. But you've got a lot of questions. Um, so that's really great. So thank you. We do have some pastors who are going to ask some questions too, but there are a lot of questions. But we want this to be an enjoyable night, um, and so I, I just hope that you can relax and know that you're in amongst friends. And So first of all, we'd like to hear from the candidates just to introduce themselves. Sometimes I do the introductions, but I think it's nicer if they introduce themselves. Um, so it's basically a three-minute introduction. And um, Janet, we might start from your end and just come along, but if you want to um, stand up while you introduce yourselves in just three minutes, and then um, we're going to get straight into the questions because there are a lot of them. Thank you very much. Please welcome Janet Wishart. Thank you, Wendy. Well, good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank you for coming out on a Tuesday night uh, to, for such an important occasion like this. So my name is Janet Wishart. I am the LMP candidate for the state seat of Mansfield. And I count this as a great privilege. You know, a lot of people have been focusing on a campaign, but for me, these last 12 months have been the greatest adventure and the greatest privilege of my life. Why? Because it's a continuation of what I love to do, which is serve and care for people. So I have always worked on the front line with people. I never saw myself going to politics. I'll be very upfront about that. I was raised in Toowoomba, so I'm a bit of an old-fashioned country girl, and my father worked in local government, so I grew up around government, but I always was raised to take care of your neighbour, express a sense of servicehood for your community, and to show respect and honour for your elders and to, to leave a legacy on your community. So I grew up with that sort of a, a, a approach to life and that sort of led me into the areas where I went into. I moved down from Toowoomba when I was, uh, went to university. I met my husband, he's in the front row here, Dougald. Uh, and that's how I became a wishart, by the way. A lot of people say to me, did you change your name to wishart for the election? I did not do that. I became a wishart 21 years ago when I got married and that has also been the greatest privilege of my life. But I started my career in aged care, palliative care and disability services because I always wanted to be an advocate and to care for those who didn't have a voice and who needed care. And then we had kids and I stayed at home and that was my most important and will always be my most important role is as a mother to train my children up in the way they should go and to leave a legacy through the next generation. And my, our oldest son was actually born with a condition, a couple of conditions, which meant that he had physical disability. So that sent me onto a path by which I also went into taking care of pastoral care of families. I pastored for, uh, for the last 10 years and also worked in uh, the missions field of taking care of girls who are rescued out of trafficking and prostitution. So my life has always been about people. And I didn't see this next step coming, but when I saw... The, uh, the future of our state and of our nation going down the drain and I became increasingly frustrated and increasingly concerned about the future that we were going to leave for our children. I decided I would stop having an opinion on the side and I would get in as a part of the fight. I thought that I would just help another excellent candidate but the conviction grew stronger and stronger and stronger that to be a part of change I had to get in the ring. I had to be a part of bringing change, of bringing uh, a future and bringing truth and bringing an expression of hope back to our community. So I put my hand up and here I am. We are now, I think it's 18 days out from the state election and I count it as a great privilege. Why? Because it's a servant-hearted role. 
It's about taking care of the people. It's about standing up for what's right. It's being a voice for those who don't have a voice. It's about creating a future that our children can flourish in. And it's about respecting the legacy we've been given by those who have left it for us. So for me, this is just a natural extension of who I am to serve people, to fight for what is right, to make a difference so that we can live in this great country and this great state of Queensland. And I count it as, um, you know, the next step in what I've been designed to do. So thank you for tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, And thank you for putting your trust in us because in the end, it's about you. It's not about us. Representation of the people has to be about getting to know the people and what's right for our community. So thank you for that privilege. Much thanks, Ian. It's great. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. My name is Ian Scanzerla. I've got a few notes here, so I don't forget what I want, or hope I don't forget what I want to say. Uh, I was drawn out of the hat as a number seven candidate on the list of seven. So I'm last on the list, but the Bible says the last shall be first and the first shall be last. (laughs) So if that happens in the election, well, so be it. And I'm a fellow Christian. I can tell by the wording here that, or the sentiments here, most of you people are Christians. And uh, I go to a Baptist church, and we all know what them Baptists are like, don't we? (laughs) And uh, anyway, I stand for the uh, Civil Liberties and Motorist Party. And I'm 79 years of age, and I've been on this planet long enough to see the decay in so many areas. And I might have left my run a bit late, but I, before I snuff it, I hope to make some changes. <clears throat> so I've got a lot of work to do in a very short time. And... Uh, So anyway, my mother was born in Australia to British parents. My father came to Australia as an Italian migrant when he was about 17. And uh, they say our surname originated in the Baltic states, and I don't even really know where that is, but that's what I'm told. Uh, And anyway, my father, uh, as a 17-year-old, he went into cutting sugar cane up North Queensland. There was no dole in those days. If you wanted a living, you had to work for it. There's no easy money, no free lunches, as we say. And uh, anyway, that's the sort of background I come from. And I've lived in and around this area most of my life. I I was born up North Queensland. Um, And uh, my sort of thrust, I suppose you could say, is most parties are telling us what they're going to do. Not many are telling us what they're going to undo. And my aim is to try and undo some of the nasty things which I think we're all inflicted with. And, um, I, and, and I've rubbed shoulders with a few of the nasties along the way too. I mean, at 79, I've seen a lot of good and bad in a lot of different people. And I know there's a lot of good and bad people in this planet and we've got to, as people, try and mix with those and try and make this planet a better place. And, uh, and as Christians, I think... That's our main aim. And as a fellow Christian, that's what I'm going to aim for. Uh, And one of the major thrusts of the uh, Civil Liberties Party party is tolls, T-O-L-L-S, road tolls on bridges, tunnels. They're unconstitutional. You can say what you like about it, but if you look it up, they're unconstitutional. And in my opinion, they must go completely entirely, now, permanently, and never come back, ever. Permanently gone. No if, buts, or maybe, no half measures, no watering it down. They must go, period. I don't know what you think about this. And uh, anyway, because if you happen to have a a toll infringement, uh, and I'll tell you something about that later, uh, it goes, if you don't pay, it goes to uh, Queensland Trust, but they pass it down the line to spur State Penalties Enforcement Register. And they don't care who you are. You can't go to their front counter, either with tolls or spur. You can only contact them by phone or letter. If they don't like what you're doing, if you don't pay, they'll suspend your licence. They'll they'll just keep up in the ante. And that happened to me. I had a $2.96 toll, according to them, 
allegedly unpaid at Currabee. So I rang him up, this bill arrived for $2.96 plus the administration fee and all the rest. And I said, hey, how much credit have I got in the account? He said, oh, 20 something dollars. Well, I said, what have I got a bill for? If I got 20 something dollars in the account, why am I getting breached? And he couldn't really answer at the time. And anyway, cut a long straw short that went from Currabee. Then they said it was Eight Mile Plains where there's no toll recording stuff. Then they said it was Murray. And eventually they said, oh, that toll tag doesn't match the vehicle. They couldn't seem to make up their mind what it was. But anyway, that toll went from $2.96 to $227. And I kept on writing letter after letter after letter. I've written at least 30 letters and got nowhere. I'd ring them up. And they keep passing the buck round and round from Spur to Queensland Transport to, to the uh, collection agent, the whole three of them. No one would deal with it. They didn't have the backbone or the stomach to make any gainful decisions. They're only enlisted, interested in scamming my money. And I furiously object to that because I had money in an account. And uh, anyway, I finally got a letter. I've got a copy here. It says... Their letter, among other things, it says I had sufficient credit in the account at that time. Later on, I got a refund check for unused money and only after I managed to get it on a talkback pro program on radio. After nearly four years it took me. This is five years ago this has been going on. I still haven't got any resolution, in my opinion. Thanks, hey, Anne. We're going to cut you off there. Have... Your three minutes is done. Oh, OK. OK, all right. thank well, you. I'm going to you here. <laughs> See you later. Thank you. I think today, tonight, should get, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Hi, I'm Glenn Cookson for Springwood, Pauline Hanson's One Nation. Uh, I grew up in the area. Um, this building, actually, I've been in it plenty of times, back when it was uh, Springwood Markets, and then it burnt down, and then it became this. Um, my first house was actually up on Barbarella Drive, not far from here. You could probably walk there in two minutes. Um, I still live in the area, um, down at Shaler Park, but I've had plenty of houses in Springwood. Um, well, I've been brought up as a Christian, but uh, unfortunately I'm not a Christian anymore, but I'm here as a decent person, bringing decent values to decent people for the electorate. And that is exactly what it has to be. So decent values for decent people. Um, I'm a mechanic over at uh, Springwood uh, at a dealership over there. Um, I started actually out on Monty Street um, as an apprentice um, and I always go off the cuff. I haven't got any notes because I just start losing the place then so I'm just rolling with it. But uh, yeah, I wanted to do this because I'm sick and tired of the uh, Lib Lab duopoly. I call it the Drib Drab uh, because I'm sick and tired of them making decisions and I can't do anything about it. So I want to throw my hat in this time around and do something about it. Um, we'll get into some of that later because I've actually brought some pol policies that are going to be set in stone uh, if I'm elected um, this coming October 31st. Halloween, hey. But um, so I'm sick and tired of that so I think it's time for a change. We need a change of government. Um, we just keep going around in a circle. So Labor, LNP, Labor, LNP, 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 Labor, 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 and obviously One Nation. Um, as I put it, we're in the middle. I call it the ring of death. Coming from a martial arts background, when you have a birthday, you stand in a ring and you've got to try and defend from attackers. So One Nation, myself and Springwood, are going to fight out of the ring of death. Um, so we've got some really good policies in place that will, will uh, be answered tonight and uh, they'll be right down your alley because they are decent values for this electorate. Thank you. Thanks, Carolee. Glenn, I hope you don't feel like you're in the ring of death tonight, sitting in the middle. <laughs> you know, people get a cake on a, normally on a birthday, but people try to kill you on your birthday. so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Promise not going to try and kill you tonight, Glenn. I'm Kiralee Bolton. I'm the Liberal National Party candidate for Springwood. And it's an absolute honour to be here to speak to you tonight. 
Um, I'm a country girl too. I grew up in Dolby and I grew up in a home where we talked about politics over meals and it was with a very clear idea that a life in politics was a life in service. And um, that was not a life that I was planning to pursue. So uh, I started my career as a radio journalist a very, very long time ago. Um, if we get into my my jobs will be here for a very long time because I've done everything from being a pizza delivery driver to disability support worker and much more. Um, my husband and I had a little snack bar down on the Gold Coast in the 90s and, uh, you know, with my Protestant work ethic, I thought if you work hard, do your best, have a great business idea and serve your customers, you'll do well. And, of course, we had the recession that we had to have. And, uh, and that was when the economy suddenly became a very real idea for me. It wasn't just some far off thing. I realised that your business can really go down the tubes if the economy is going down the tubes. So I have a great deal of sympathy for small business owners and because I know their families, they're trying to feed their families and the, and the personal impact for them is quite real. So obviously the, you know, the recession we're having now is, is huge. Can, that was just a blip, what was going on then. So uh, if I just fast forward through all of those um, careers, probably the, <laughs> the other things I should tell you about myself is I'm, I'm married to Matt, the man with the spiky hair over there. It's always easy to find him in a crowd. He's the community's pastor at uh, Hope Centre in Logan. Uh, we have two young adult children who are the apple of my eye, or would you say the apples of my eyes? I'm not quite sure, but I love them. <laughs> um, Hope Centre is a wonderful uh, church community of people from all walks of life, both sides of the track and all four corners of the globe. And um, one thing I've learned in this journey is I have to be really careful when I'm talking about my, my church and my faith because... I get really emotional and politicians aren't supposed to show their emotions apparently. But um, yeah, it's a very important part of our lives and Matt has just celebrated 20 years um, in ministry there. So uh, I've had, as I said, all kinds of jobs on the journey to being here and my uh, last job has been working for the Endeavour Foundation. So I went there in 2011 to advocate for the introduction of the NDIS and my job at the moment, uh, till stopping to do this, has been to advocate for better government policies for people with intellectual disability to have jobs, particularly focused on 2,000 people that were employed by Endeavour Foundation. And so now I'm very concerned about the 200,000 people who are out of work in Queensland and how we can address their needs, the needs of their children and what the future looks like for them. So I'm running to be a positive change for my community and hopefully a positive change for Queensland too. Thank you. Thanks very much, Curly. Thank you, Judy. Good evening. I start by acknowledging the traditional landowners that we're meeting on here tonight. I pay my respects to past, present and emerging elders. So, as you can see, I'm from the Animal Justice Party. Things are probably a little bit different for us. Um, first time running, I'm a local business owner and local resident within the local community for the last 29 years now. Um, so, let me tell you a little bit about the Animal Justice Party. I will follow my notes because I can tend to waffle on a bit and I'm mindful of time for you, Wendy. So the Animal Justice Party is the only political party that is dedicated to protecting animals and nature. Our core values are kindness, equality, rationality and non-violence. This coming state election we have our 10 point plan which is our commitment to bringing issues to the forefront, things like human health, the health of our planet our environment and, of course, the animals. I'm passionate about raising awareness within the community about local and state issues when it comes to the cruelty that is inflicted on animals and the effects we are having on our planet. 
This is affected by our everyday lifestyles. The choices that we make, we may not realise. We are actually affecting farmed animals, domesticated animals, sea life and wildlife. I believe it's time to demand some transparency and accountability through the political decisions that are made that directly affect animals and our planet and our humans. Things like land clearing, urban sprawl and habitat loss. Super, super important. It's something that's affecting billions of animals every single year and also every single Queenslander. Many people, I believe, many people are not really aware or in tune with our current environmental crisis, climate change. Many of us are not aware of the cruel industries of puppy farming, greyhound racing and animal experimentation. Does anybody here actually know what goes on in the greyhound racing or horse racing industries? Let's not forget the real cause of COVID-19. Where did that originate? So together, I propose that we create a safer state for animals, humans and our planet. Let's extend our compassion beyond our companion animals and extend that to all living beings. Could you imagine a world where we could all coexist in peace together? So voting one for the Animal Justice Party, it sends out a strong message that you do care about animals and nature. Thank you very much. I'll leave that on the table for you um, for answers. I, um, I always just want to thank you all for being here so much because uh, you really, you have no knowledge of what questions are going to be asked. Many of you are first time candidates. It's actually very brave. Um, and I can assure you we are a really lovely audience, aren't we, everybody? Yeah. So I have a lot of questions that have come in. I do have two pastors who are going to ask some questions first up. But one of the questions that's come in was asking about Mr. De Brenny, what, um, what he, uh, why he's not here. Um, and so I'm just going to pull that up. Um, and it was particularly asking what he said when we invited him. So um, it, uh, he ha isn't here, obviously. I still didn't get an answer from Mr. De Brenny. Uh, I did get an answer from everybody else except the United Australia Party. I didn't get an answer from that gentleman either. But um, Mr. De Brenny said, first of all, uh, he said he didn't get my invitation. So I, but I had the um, receipt of the invitation, you know, so I re-sent I re it to him, uh, but I still didn't get, didn't get a reply. Um, so Dave Pello did co follow him up, um, but he declined to come. And I think that's a real shame uh, because we do want to hear from all of our um, electoral candidates and we spe you know, especially want to hear from our sitting members. So uh, he has declined to come. Now, the first question tonight is from Peter Earle. Um, a former colleague, sort of, of mine, predecessor of me. Um, and Peter Earl is from Networks Church and he's going to ask a question. Now, you, uh, I think you'll all get the opportunity to answer any of the questions. Um, if you don't have anything particular that you want to say, you're able to say that as well. But Thanks, Peter. Let me thank the candidates for uh, coming tonight and uh, listening to us as we ask your questions and we appreciate that. But my question is very simple tonight. It's, it's re revolving around COVID-19. As you know, the churches, we were shut down during COVID-19. And we consider ourselves to be an essential service, that during a crisis, we're the people who give love, counsel, understanding and help. But we've been shut down, and yet others are uh, allowed to operate as essential services. And the uh, list is a little bit unusual at times. We've got Bunnings, bottle shops and brothels. As essential services. Now, we believe that the church should be essential service and uh, it would help us if just, just some small things were changed. For instance, if we could continue to have services in homes with 15 people, that would uh, make a huge difference to, I believe, the health of our community. You know, we provide a community service. So my question is simply, will you fight for us to be uh, an essential service? 
Thanks, Peter. Would you pass that microphone um, up to the table for us as well? Um, yeah, I might just add to that because uh, the rules are actually very contradictory at the moment. So if you uh, have a party at home or even a wedding or any sort of um, thing at home, you're allowed to have 30 people and they can be from different households. But if you're having a Bible study or a worship group, it's six. If you go to church, you can't stand to eat and drink, but you can at a pub or a club or a restaurant. So there are some contradictions. I think it's, it's really hard for our politicians to be making these rules on the hop because, you know, things are difficult and it is changing. But there's no, there's no reason why there would be that discrepancy. So that's just a little bit of a personal comment. So is there somebody who'd like to start us off with that? You're reaching, Kiralee? Yeah, one of the things that I, um, I've done in recent years was fight for the introduction of a Human Rights Act in Queensland. Now, a lot of people are dubious about human rights, but to me it was important because um, I want people with a disability to get a fair deal, but also because I want freedom to practice and teach and believe and communicate about my religion. And I want everyone else to have that freedom as well. So to me, a natural extension of that is that we, mu we must be able to worship. Now, it's not a simple thing for us to do if we have a lot of elderly people in our churches, if we have people who are, who are unwell, people with disabilities. We don't want to create an unsafe environment. So I think it's important that, um, that somebody is willing to stand up for churches to be able to worship and to try and navigate a way through where we can spend time together, it's, it's really important for the mental health of people in churches and for our ability to serve our communities. Thanks, Curly. Yes, Janet. Can I just add to that? I think uh, this time has been an incredible time where the church has really risen up in our community. And from the very beginning, seeing the way the church responded by serving into our local community was quite astounding. And also the way that it became flexible. We've been able to reach into the community online services. But I think um, just bouncing off of what Kira Lee has said, um, and it's such a privilege to be a colleague of, of Kira Lee's, uh, we are going into a time now where with extended lockdown, we're seeing the consequences of being uh, locked away and the uh, social isolation and the, the ability for us to gather together um, in worship and in fellowship is so important for the mental health of our community. And as we have the privilege of door knocking at the moment as a, as a campaign, so many times I'm seeing the people who are so socially isolated and the church is an essential service for people to gather together to be able to express a relationship with one another, to support one another. And I think that it's incredibly important. As, a, as a, an LMP team, we have been calling for consistency, compassion and common sense. And as you uh, align to there, Wendy, some of these restrictions uh, don't show common sense. <laughs> they also don't show consistency. Mm -hmm. So uh, we would be very keen to, to address the restrictions and look at those three things, as I said, common sense, consistency, and compassion, because we have a community that needs to be able to re-engage for the sake of mental health, I, I believe. Thanks, Janet. Is there anyone else who'd like, Ian, you'd like to comment? If I make a quick comment, how come churches are being shut down but we can have 25,000 to a football match and you've got to think it must be all about money as the main central focus and yet as a church which, which is here to look after the needs of people, we've been shut down and there's something wrong with the whole process. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn? Yeah, I saw in the... Um in the news um, as a national, not as a state, but uh, obviously they're playing by what the uh, federal government are saying. How come mosques are actually allowed to open up and have all their worshippers go in? I think it should be freedom for everybody. As I said, even though I'm not a, uh, you know, uh, a Christian thinking anymore, but um, it should be equality for all. If they're gonna start opening the floodgates for one religion, they should do it for all. So if religious freedom, uh, as Mark Latham says, from one nation in New South Wales, you know, everybody has a right to their own thoughts and their own religions. Um, but why should one sort of group be singled out and one get shunned? But Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. 
pretty much agree with everybody here tonight. Um, I think the social isol isolating, the isolating really has gotten to a lot of people, obviously mental health as well. Um, so important to build community, keep people coming together. I totally agree. I, I don't know why the restrictions were laid out like they were. Um, and one of the things that really frustrated me was um, greyhound racing being classed as essential. I mean, there's, you know, animal cruelty happening there and also the, the type of people that are losing their money in a, in a case like this with, with a national pandemic. Um, yeah. Totally agree with you, Judy. I was one of the ones going to that um, proposed Greyhound site in Logan trying to stop that happening. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I did get another question in between. I'm then I'm going to go to um, Pastor Tony. Wendy, you commented on the response from the current Springwood MP and then asked about the Mansfield MP, who states she really cares for all the community. Given the large Christian percentage in Mansfield, her lack of attendance is disappointing, begs the question of how much, if at all, she respects the voice of her Christian constituents. So I just read that um, from the question. The, um, all of the other candidates from Mansfield actually declined to come. Um, and this is the first election, I'd have to say, that I've had that response. Um, I used to work for Lyle Shelton, who is here tonight with Wendy, and I was always very proud to tell him that I got all of the um, candidates to come. So he, was, he used to give me a pat on the back. He wouldn't at the moment because uh, I'm having a lot of um, people decline, which I think is a real shame. Because <laughs> we, um, Australian Christian Lobby has grown enormously over the time that I've been with them. And we, we are the second largest political lobby group in the nation. So I think, I think we deserve to, to be heard and to, to be able to ask the questions. Okay, so Pastor Tony, thank you very much for hosting us as well. Really appreciate you allowing us to use your beautiful facility. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Wendy. And I'd like to thank all you guys for your heart to serve. I know <coughs> my accent's different. Um, we're, we've been here showed up when I was about 49 years old, so it's kind of hard to change accents. Uh, but we are, we're citizens, took six years, uh, so we're, we love Australia. And so here's uh, one of the deal breakers uh, in God's word. Oh. Okay, is that better? One of the deal breakers in God's word is it's really clear about sanctity of human life. And so the scripture teaches us about that. And, you know, Jesus died for people, and, but I, I mean, we, I love dogs and I love animals, but Jesus shed his blood and died for people. And so they're, you know, the sanctity of life of people is number one. And the sixth commandment stated, you shall not murder. And I consider it a matter of injustice and a violation of fundamental human rights that are granted to us by God and not any human authority that a government should fail to do its duty to protect the lives of the innocent and and babies can't protect themselves so uh, and so they need protected from the abortion industry and then additionally uh, to also fail to promote adequate protections for women who tragically feel that they have no other choice and so um, my question a couple questions here will you promise should the opportunity arise to vote in Parliament for mandatory independent counseling for women before elective abortions are chosen, as well as screening for abortion coercion. And also then, will you also promise to support other proposed amendments, including to ban late term and sex selective abortions? Okay, hope you can remember those questions. And so this, it would really help us to know that. Thanks, Glenn. No problem. Um, here um, it is right here. Right to life policy. One nation will repeal the labour abortion laws, not to the extent uh, that um, the Catholics want actually none. We will actually put in place, uh, cancel late term abortions, uh, the uh, sex selection, because we believe that actually, you know, 
these babies, that's a, it's, it's a trust. I just can't believe it. I really can't believe it. When I uh, read our policy on the right to life, I could not believe the Labor passed those back in 2018 and all high-fived each other in Parliament. Absolutely disgraceful. Um, that's, Thanks, Glenn. That's Thank all you. I can say. Here it is right here. One Nation policy on right to life. You can come and read it afterwards if you, if you need to. Uh, all the points are in there. Thanks, Glenn. Kiralee, you've got the mic. Well, the LNB, LNP has made a commitment to review the gestation limits um, and look at whether they can be brought down because we do, at the moment, we have abortion on demand over 22 weeks. Um, the LNP's made a commitment to the introduction of... or looking at the introduction of mandatory counselling for women and measures to prevent coercion of women to have abortions, which is obviously it's a, a form of domestic violence if it's happening within a relationship. We haven't looked at sex selective abortion um, as, as one of the policies that we've announced. Um, however, you know, I think, I think all of those things would, would be helpful to wind back the laws that have been introduced. So as a person of faith, it's important to me that we do have a conscience vote on these matters and that we're able to um, vote as people who believe in the sanctity of life. Thank you. Ian, you're picking up the... I've got an audio visual at home and it explains the process of abortion. And this audio visual clearly points out that they can measure brain activity in what we call a fetus from six weeks after conception. And that fetus or that baby can feel pain. And, and the, some of the methods of abortion, they use a powerful suction pump to actually tear that baby to pieces. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it's quite frightening that we can destroy human life like that when God tells us we're going to preserve human life, not tear it to bits in the way they do. It's disgusting, quite frankly. Thanks, Anne. Judy, did you want to say anything? Uh, I don't have an awful lot to extend on what has already been said. Uh, I think it's definitely when you mentioned about counselling, consultation with the woman, um, that's, that's gold. I mean, every, I think every case needs to be treated individually, personally, that sort of thing, definitely with the counselling whatever help is, is available to that woman. Janet, did you want to add? Look, the only thing I would add, and obviously uh, Kira Lee has outlined the LNP's policies on this, uh, I am a pro-lifer, absolutely, and the only other thing that I think we need to do is explore all of the options around uh, this topic when it comes to support services as well. If we're going to talk about abortion, we need to talk about fostering. We need to talk about adoption laws. We need to talk about support for disability services. As a mum who had a child with a disability, who I've had many people say to me, do you ever consider aborting? Mm. I'm a person of faith, so that wasn't an option. But there are many, many women out there who are in situations that we can't begin to imagine. Yeah. And as a society, we need to take care of our most vulnerable. And we need to make sure that we advocate for pro uh, providing services for them as well. So in addition to counselling, I think we have, and I'm very proud that the LNP has, as a part of other policies, said that we will look at fostering, we will look at our adoption laws, uh, and I think that we need to be very holistic in the way that we move forward to provide supports not only for that child but for the mother, for the father's rights in these situations. We don't talk about the father's rights, the grandparents, but as a society we need to embrace and holistically care for those in these circumstances. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, thank you all. Um, we do have, I don't know whether you've already welcomed him, Dave, but we have Mark Robinson here tonight, the MP from Ujiru. And Mark and Julie are two of the most passionate, the most long-suffering people in this pro-life um, fight, I guess. So thank you, Mark and Julie. We, we honour you and we thank you. I have a lot of people ask me, um, and I know I'm not the one answering questions tonight, but I'd just like to make a, a, just a few comments. I have a lot of people say to me, the ALP did not, did not um, 
legalise abortion to birth. You, you, you're, you're making that up. You can't be serious. So can I just read to you from their document and just explain to you why what I say is true? Up until 22 weeks of, abor of pregnancy, abortion is available with no questions asked. So that's just a blanket statement, no questions asked. After 22 weeks of pregnancy, and this is where I get people pushing back on me. So after 22 weeks of pregnancy, a, any woman can legally have an abortion for the following reasons. Physical, psychological or social reasons. I'm not sure what other reasons there would be. So after 22 weeks, it is legal to have an abortion for physical, psychological or social reasons. The doctor and not the woman the doctor performing the post 22 week abortion needs to confer with another doctor that can be somebody in the side in the room beside them at the abortion clinic it can be over the phone it could be an email the woman does not to see anybody other than one doctor who will perform a post 22 week abortion there are no legal grounds for a doctor in Queensland to actually refuse an abortion and if somebody does not want to do an abortion then they are bound by law to refer to somebody who will. So when I say that the ALP um, introduced some of the most horrendous abortion laws in our country, that's why. Um, so I've got some other questions uh, that we're going to move on to now, and I've probably got more questions than I can ask, but I will be able to send these questions to the candidates, and if you'd like to email Dave or I afterwards, you'd be able to get some answers. But I've got one particularly for you, Judy, um, and it's about the Animal Justice Party, and the, you might not be able to answer this, but it's will you stop the brutal method of slaughtering for halal meats? Do you know halal? Do you know anything about that? Those words that you just mentioned, the brutal slaughter? Yeah. That's what it is. It, yep. it doesn't matter if it's halal, whatever it is. Um, if you bless the animal before they're slaughtered, it, that animal is still feeling the pain. They still suffer. They can feel pain and suffer just like us. We're all animals. We just have different coverings, fur, feathers, skin, whatever mm. we have. Yep. Thank I, you. There's no way. There's there's yep. no way to support that sort of stuff. Yep. Like honestly, it's it's three things for our environment, our health, and for the animals. There's there's just no need for it. Um, the next question is to the LNP candidates. How will a Queensland state LNP government support Indigenous cultural burning in the move to prevent horrific bushfires? Now, some of these questions you might just have to take on notice because you, it might not be something that you know about, but... Could you repeat that one? Sorry. Yeah. How will a Queensland state LNP government support Indigenous cultural burning in the move to prevent horrific bushfires? Look, I think in the, at the end of 2020, when we saw what happened at the beginning of this year, it feels like a faint memory, doesn't it, once COVID hit. But I think at the beginning of 2020 and 2019, Australia was hit with some of the most horrific sites of bushfire. And so we are very, very uh, passionate about ensuring that we provide... Uh, a solution and we do everything that we can as a part of that and I'm, I'm pretty sure Kiralee as part of your uh, commitments you've also got more to say about uh, rural bushfire as well but uh, looking at making sure that we put in place uh, policies that will look at clearing and making sure that we minimise the risk and that uh, as a part of that inclusive of the Indigenous uh, policy, the, the Indigenous culture and because let's be honest sometimes we don't always know what's best. <laughs> Um, Kiralee, did you so want to speak true. to that? Yes, um, Indigenous traditional practices with, with um, burning is part of our policy. So we've released a 10-point uh, bushfire mitigation plan, which the uh, bushfire, um, sorry, the QFS and the, and the rural bushfire people have looked at. Sorry, I'm forgetting all my now titles tonight. There's so many um, letters. <laughs> and it's been developed in consultation with them and the Bushfire Royal Commission has also given that the tick of approval. Um, it's a particular interest for Springwood Electorate because the Mount Cotton area has a thousand hectares of fuel load and um, in my view a fire in Mount Cotton very quickly becomes a fire in mm. Daisy Hill or Priestdale, Underwood Park. Um, so traditional burning practice are one, are one of uh, many things that are on that list. 
Thank you. Um, there's another question here to the LNP, but um, feel free, other people, to, to put your hand up as well. And my question is to the LNP. In what way would you have handled the COVID crisis, and in particular borders, so that the aged and vulnerable are well protected? So it's how would you have handled the COVID crisis um, to protect our... And, and keeping in mind protecting our aged and vulnerable? Uh, the LNP has been very clear that we support strong border measures and in that, that we acknowledge that we have to protect lives. There is nothing more precious than life. We've already discussed that tonight. And that we also have to have a very common sense approach because we also have to protect livelihoods. So in, uh, in, the, in the border restrictions, it's a much broader protection that we're talking about, but certainly the, you know, the, the restrictions that were put in place around the vulnerable and our aged community. I mean, I, I know having elderly parents and having so many constituents in my area that are aged, that was a significant impact on them. And one of the first things we did as a team was actually make sure we, go out, we went out and made contact with our most uh, vulnerable in the aged, rang them, uh, made sure they were okay, got groceries organised. This was, um, you know, before any of the other armies that were mobilised because we knew that by restricting and by locking them down, we were going to be able to protect their lives. But there's a lot more that's involved in quality of life. So it was important to make sure that we engaged our community. Uh, we got a, a Locals Lending a Hand program and, and made sure that people were actually connected. Uh, we got our local pastors on a Zoom and our local chaplains to make sure that we could mobilise our communities. So, but in response to the question around the borders, uh, the LNP has always called for strong border measures in, uh, in response to the, the medical advice, which has not always been transparent and we haven't always had access to that medical advice. Uh, but Deb Frecklington and the LNP have said, if elected as Premier, she will work with a common sense, compassion and consistency, uh, a, a consistent approach with borders in association with the, the current health advice as per the, the National Cabinet and per uh, the state directions as well. Thanks, Janet. Yes, please, Judy. Yeah. I'd just like to add briefly, um, the uh, depending on who's in power after October 31st, but I think a really, really big, important part of the whole COVID-19 pandemic is what are we going to do to prevent the next one from happening? Because it will happen, we know how it occurred and we need to address why it occurred and to prevent the next one from happening. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, I um, agree with Senator Malcolm Roberts, Pauline Hanson's One Nation. Uh, we should have taken steps as in uh, what Taiwan did, uh, protect the vulnerable and the elderly, not lock them down as so they can't, you know, like a jail sentence, but then everybody else can be free to move about. Uh, they've got a similar population to Australia, but on a much smaller continent or area, and they only had um, recorded nine deaths. So I led to believe, as uh, Senator Roberts' report, uh, we should have done that here, shut the international border, but then everybody else can move around freely, keep the economy going. Thanks, Glenn. Mm, people like that. Okay, um, the next question is, and it's from Dr Jane Truscott. Thank you, Jane. Um, what is your position regarding voluntary assisted dying legislation for Queensland? Do you support it or not, and why? Your position on voluntary assisted dying, it's often called euthanasia or um, assisted suicide. What is your position on voluntary assisted dying legislation? Do you support it or not, and why? Ian, you're reaching. Well, the Bible says the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. I don't believe we have the right uh, to be saying that people need to be euthanized, killed, or whatever you want to term you want to use it. So I think it's that choice belongs to God. Yeah, there is no uh, One Nation stance on voluntary assisted dying. It's actually a personal matter for uh, each candidate to. Um, answer um, but everybody's got their own opinion so I'm sorry that uh, that's actually going to be left down to the individual person who may actually be sick who may be wanting to die uh, not a 
politician, but it's actually the right of the person if they wish to or if they don't wish to. But my personal philosophy, fight for what you can and uh, if you can't, then that's entirely up to you. Uh, our position on it is that the current laws which uh, do not allow for voluntary assisted dying do not need to be changed. But I also think, similarly to what we spoke about with abortion, we need to really investigate uh, the area of palliative care. I worked in palliative care. I've sat by many, many people as they, as they passed, uh, you know, with families, often for very long periods of time. I also sat next to and cared for my grandmother in her final days as well. And uh, the current government has 1% of its health budget given to palliative care. <laughs> I don't think we can start looking at voluntary assisted dying until we look at ensuring that we have got quality of life and quality of care for those in those, uh, in those later days. I also think we need to be very careful around how we perceive what voluntary assisted dying is. And often uh, people think that it's about, uh, you know, with allowing somebody at the late stages of their life to have that, that option. But uh, I sat in the uh, commissional hearing for this and there, were, there was discussions around children. There was discussions around mental health. So I think that um, when we're talking about this, we need to engage very carefully in the discussion around how that's defined. And we must, as a community and as a society and as a government, invest in quality of palliative care. Unless anybody wants to say anything, I'll move on. I've got a number of questions here that have come in about the abortion issue. I think we have already covered it, um, so I'm not going to ask every question, but there are some that just break my heart. Um, what is your position on full-term abortions where a live babe is left to perish? Um, now, you know, some, some people might think that's a really extreme question. I mean, in 2015, um, Mark Robinson, MP, asked a question in Parliament about how many babies were left to die after an abortion that were born alive. And if my memory serves me correctly, it was 27 in the year, um, in one year, 2015. Um, very recently, he asked the same question. So the first question was to the then Health Minister, Cameron Dick. The question this time was our current Health Minister. And I've got the, um, I've got the stats here in front of me. And so it was a 30-week period, uh, just from December 2018 to the 30th of June 2019. That's the most recent statistics. And in that 30-week period, 19 abortions resulted in a live birth outcome. So for a live birth outcome, no, no medical assistance is given to those babies. So that question might seem pretty radical and raw to many people, um, but it's actually a very significant question. Um, this one is a similar question, but it, it's slightly different because it includes more in the, in the question. Um, if I give you my vote, in what way will your voice advocate for those little unheard voices? Our unborn, we've touched on that, homeless who are mentally ill, elderly, in particular to influence your party's policy if there isn't currently one in written form. So the people, the most vulnerable in our society, and many of you have already worked with those people. So what, if, I, if you're, you get this person's vote, how will you advocate for those people? Kira Lee, would you like to go? Yeah, I spent my life advocating for those people yeah. and I'll continue to do it particularly interested in um, mental health services. Um, there's just incredible pain out there in the community. One of the things that, um, when Janet talked about door knocking and, and so on, one of the things that um, often happens is people will disclose to you that they've just lost their husband or wife, or they will talk to you about a, uh, a family member who's committed suicide. Um, or, uh, you know, I won't traumatise you by talking about some of the things people talk about, experiences they've had in other countries as well. There's a lot of pain out there in the community and we do need good mental health services for people. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. I think the way that we care for the most vulnerable and those without a voice in our society speaks about who we are as people and as a society. 
And I think that, it, as I said earlier, uh, you know, it's a privilege to be able to be a voice for your community, but often it's the ones without a voice and the most silent that need the voice the most. There are so many of those, as Kiralee just said, you know, those with mental illness, those with, uh, you know, anxiety locked up but, you know, because of their own anxiety in their own homes, uh, those with disabilities, the homeless, the aged, the vulnerable young, those in abuse, domestic violence, it goes on and it goes on. But my boss used to say to me, to succumb to the enormity of the problem is to fail the one. And we must be a voice for those ones. Otherwise, we are, um, we are failing you know, society as a whole. So my life has always been about advocacy. Over four, just over 14 months ago, I was in, uh, in, a, uh, in a brothel <laughs> uh, watching you know, three-year-old girls being sold. Uh, and I yet again committed that the rest of my life would be a voice for those who have no voice. That's why I'm here and that's what I'll continue to do, whether I'm honoured to be elected as a Member of Parliament for Mansfield or not. Uh, my voice will be about raising awareness and being a voice for those without. Thank you. Can I just say one yes, more? Yes, sure. Um, and then we'll go to you, Glenn. I, yeah, I just wanted to say that I think uh, a lot of these issues are... It's not necessarily the government's... Um, it's, they're not necessarily things that the government can address. I do think churches are incredibly good at mm. responding to issues like this. And we see it again and again in our church. Sometimes I think 50% of the ladies coming to our church are fleeing from abusive relationships. Um, and, you know, the church is very good at responding to people's need, as are community groups and including secular organisations. And I think those, those church and community can do it cheaper, better and in a far more nimble and responsive way than the government ever can. You can't legislate care. Thanks, Kiralee. Yeah, that's good. Glenn, thank you. Yeah, there's a, um, you know... Well, a lot of people out there that have contributed, you know, to society, tax work, you know, ta paid their taxes, you know, done their job for the community, um, whether it be social. Um, I know of a friend uh, at work at the moment. Um, his mum got cancer, I won't say names. Um, she's recovering and you know, his dad just literally got uh, put out of work, made redundant, so they're finding it tough. Um, they're nice people. Um, and that's people like that that actually definitely do need, um, you know, care when, when it's needed because, you know, you go top of the mountain one minute, right to the bottom the next, just like that. And it's those people that definitely need somewhere to go uh, and get some help. It's been surprising to hear how many people are the first time that they've had um, food insecurity during the COVID time. There's more and more people who are feeling vulnerable. Okay, no more comments there. Move on to the next question. Um, as a mother and a grandmother, sounds like me. <laughs> no, it's not me. But. As a mother and a grandmother, I am very concerned about climate change and also about preventing future pandemics. What are the policies and positions of each candidate on these two issues? So we've talked a little bit about the pandemic, especially Judy mentioned that. But um, climate change and preventing future pandemics, concern for the next generation. Thanks, Judy. Wow. Wow. What an amazing question. Thank you. So the two main topics for preventing the next pandemic are actually for climate change. They're very, they're very closely related. Climate change, there's two main issues. One is our diet. The other, anybody know the other? Our diet, our emissions, what we are doing to our planet. So we need to re not only stop climate change, but also reverse it. So rewild, replant the trees that we've knocked down. Animal agriculture is the main driver as well. The trees again being knocked down, the water that's being polluted, it's all contributing. I just learnt on Sunday night that methane gas excreted from cattle is in the air for 10 to 12 years. So. Think about that. Uh, with the next, with the pandemic, sorry, just touching on that briefly, we know what caused the last pandemic. 
we all do know what caused it. So what are we going to do to prevent the next one from happening? We, it's all well and good having restrictions, but there's more to it than just isolation, hand sanitising, social distancing. There's so much more we can do, and it starts again with our diet. How we're treating the, the vulnerable again. Thanks, Judy. Okay, so the, the question is about climate change policy and preventing the future pandemic. Yeah, so I think um, I think we most people understand that climate change is real. The, the world is changing, and I certainly believe that. Um, I think what we can do about it. A great, one of the great policies that LNP has is to mandate investment in renewable energies by government-owned energy corporations. We're obviously not ready to switch over to renewable energies, as a lot of people have suggested to me in the last six months. I just don't believe we are there. Um, I think we can make a transition towards that, and uh, it'll be a while before we can ever get there. But we, uh, we, we need to care for the planet. The LNP has very deeply embedded in our values that whilst we need to have economic development, we must protect the environment for future generations. And we can, we can see that the environment is changing in some areas. In terms of preventing future pandemics, um, I think the world has had a huge wake up call. And uh, I don't think Australia will ever go back to the way it was. And uh, I think we have um, the medical knowledge, we have the structures and the processes to, to manage our response to pandemics in Queensland. I worked at Queensland Health for five years and was part of the emergency management team there. And we, we know what to do. We've had many pandemics um, in Queensland. My big concern is that while we've managed that, we haven't managed the economy. And so we have this desperate, desperate situation with unemployment and many more people are about to fall off the unemployment cliff. And that has dreadful health impacts and mental health impacts as well. And I think we're, gonna, we're going to reap, reap that as time goes on. Kira Lee's the first one who got the bell. <laughs> Thanks, Kira Lee. That's great. Yes, Glenn? Um, pandemics. Um, like we've had, I think we should, as a nation and a state, we should operate quicker than uh, wait for the World Health Organization, because they're just a pile of bureaucrats, basically, uh, taking orders from the UN. So we need to think for ourselves. And I think as uh, Australians and Queenslanders, we're more than capable of, of doing that. Um, on the climate change, um, myself personally, the world is going through climate change, but it's a natural climate change, not a man-made one. Um, you know, the world tilts on its own axis. It does do different things. Um, people say, oh, the glaciers are melting. You know, well, of course they're gonna melt because it's, the world isn't frozen like it was back in the ice age. You know, you leave an ice cube out for a while or put it in the fridge. It's still cold in there, but it still melts. Um, wind turbines, there's a really good, uh, um, Fraser Coast, they're looking at putting over 200 wind turbines up on the Fraser Coast, taller than the Eiffel Tower. Well, what's that going to do? I mean, how are they going to build those? And it's going to have to be uh, coal-fired power stations. You, know, you can't build them otherwise because the, uh, you know, they don't put out that same amount of power as a coal-fired power station. We well, do want to keep the lights on and when actually does do, I mean, I was thought about it the other day, it's like a... Um, you know, if you put too much power into the grid, your lights go out. It's like a, um, the alternator light in your car. I call it idiot lights because basically that's what they used to have in the older days. And uh, I know how it works. Basically, there's a circuit in your alternator that causes it to go um, back up to the, to the light. And if actually, when you turn the ignition on, the light comes on because there's power going through the light. When the alternator actually starts up, power goes up to the light, cancels it out. So you get a blackout. So, Thanks, uh, Glenn. Thank you. So One Nation's <laughs> uh, policy on climate change is a natural climate change, not man-made.
Thanks, Ian. Okay. Well, I don't believe the word pandemic is correct. The word pandemic is uh, represents. I, I, can't, I haven't got the percentages with me here, but it's no. What the deaths we have are regrettable, but nowhere near the numbers required to call it a pandemic. As for climate change, I've got a photo at home of the Murray River. A uh, hundred years ago, it was bone dry, and they showed one of the early model old cars driving through the base of the Murray River. It's just a natural cycle to, to life, and it's something we've got to live with. And as for coal-fired power stations, uh, yippee, I say, I want them. I, I don't believe all this baloney about having to shut down coal-fired. We've got the best natural resources in the world, and now we're going to shut it down just because some greenie doesn't like it. Well, sorry if I offend you, but look, I don't agree with it. Thanks, Anne. I just wanted to uh, jump off of what Kiwali was saying. She's already sort of outlined uh, what I wanted to say around climate change. But as in regards to the pandemic, I think where Kiwali was heading with that is the other thing we need to be acknowledging here is the economic devastation of this last six months. We have now over 240,000 people out of work and many people think that's because of the pandemic. But we went into this as a state with $91 billion in debt the highest long-term unemployment, the highest unemployment, and the lowest business confidence of any state in this country. We also need to, as a Queensland state, become a powerhouse that we once was. And, and so in order for us to also be able to be prepared for whatever comes, regardless of whether it be a natural disaster, another pandemic, or whatever, because we're never sure of what is going to come tomorrow, we need to rebuild Queensland and to be able to create a place by which we can make it a good place to get a job, to, to live with our families and to give a good future for our children. The Queensland that I grew up in is fast disappearing. And we need a change of government so that we can be able to be prepared not only from a health response but from an economic response. And uh, the way we're going now, we're now forecast to be into $100 billion, uh, $120 billion in debt. And uh, I heard on the radio this morning the current Treasurer Cameron Dick saying um, that they're going to borrow more money and that uh, we will just have to live with a deficit for the next four years. So I think that that's another way that we need to, as a as a... As it, for a change of government to prepare for what comes in the future. So that actually um, probably goes into the next question, which is uh, an important question. Do you have a general overview on government size and influence? For example, make government bigger or smaller, more control or less control, increase spending or reduce spending, balance the budget or go further in debt? So you're already talking, Janet. Do you just want to... And, and if we can try and keep the, question, the answers really short so that we can get on to just a couple more. On that last point, I think we don't know how to balance a budget if we don't have a budget. And currently in Queensland, we don't have a budget. So first and foremost, uh, I think we need to... And we have made a commitment for the first 100 days to deliver a budget here in Queensland. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. I, I was brought up with where we got out on the t we got the money out on the table and you put the envelopes on the table and you put the money in the envelopes and that was how we budgeted. Now my husband's giving me that look because he's like, well, I don't think you know what our family budget is right now. <laughs> but that's why I married Smart and I married him. Um, so, but uh, yeah, just on that point and uh, and I'm aware of the time and I'll, I want to let others speak. But um, to balance a budget, we need to have one in the first place. If I could make a comment about the debt, I was told about three or four years ago by one of the MPs that the state debt amounts to half a million dollars every hour. Half a million an hour. That's about 84 million a week. That was three or four years ago. Before now, the debt's got a lot higher. They're going to blame the corona thing. They'll blame whatever they like. But the fact is, your kids are going to pay for that debt. And we're all going to pay for it. And, uh, it, you know, that debt is created from nothing. If you look in the books in the, uh, on banking, banks don't lend money. They create credit out of zero, zilch, nothing. And they charge the borrower interest. 
And if they can create money like that, well, they can ditch the debt like Iceland. Iceland got rid of their debt. They were hopelessly in debt, could never get out of it. And they said to the IMF bankers and, shall I say, the Rothschilds, that might be a naughty word, they said, we're not, we're not going to pay you. Get out of here. They jailed some and threw the rest out and they said, we're not going to pay you. And I think we're going to have to take drastic action the same. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Small government, big government. That's another part of the question. Yeah, um, One Nation is definitely uh, make a smaller government and that way that uh, there's actually more, you know, less people making decisions over the state of Queensland, even though that we have actually got uh, 90 candidates sitting there uh, ready to go for this election uh, out of the 91 seats. Um, I'm optimistic. I'm hoping we're going to get in because we need to give these other parties a good kick in the pants. Uh, we've got shovel-ready projects ready for the state of Queensland so that we can get going again. Uh, with the debt, obviously there's a, there's a billion dollars actually sitting there in actual debts waiting for people. So some of that debt could actually go towards creating another project, creates more money, creates jobs, and then the, um, it comes back into the economy. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Curly. Well, you can't tax your way out of a recession. It just doesn't work. And, uh, you know, I heard Deb saying today her vision is to return Queensland to the low tax state it once was. Just because you have money in your pocket, the government shouldn't be looking at you <laughs> to fix all of their problems. What we can do is grow our economy. And so the spending the LNP will do will stimulate the economy to get people spending, to get people in work, and that's how we'll address the state's debt. We don't, uh, we, we believe in small government. We believe in interfering in your lives as little as possible. Um, and we, we just we don't want to burden you with the tax on every success that you have. It's just um, it just drives business backwards. So we want to guarantee there'll be no new taxes, so that businesses have the confidence to invest, expand, and create more jobs. Which means there'll be jobs for my kids, your kids, and our grandchildren. Thanks, Caroline. <laughs> so um, one of the questions about big. Big government, small government, I think, in the interference of government is never as um, probably blatant as what we've seen with the gender fluid ideology coming into our schools. It's a very good example of, of um, big government telling us as parents what we're going to have to teach our children. And there's a couple of questions about this, so uh, I'll read just one of them because they're very similar. And the question is Are you for or against gender fluid education? So, um, in 2018, the ALP government made, uh, and I wish they were here to talk to us about this, I really do, but um, they made Respectful Relationships course compulsory throughout Queensland schools. So we have gender fluid education in all of our schools uh, across Queensland. Now some teachers um, may choose not to use that curriculum, but that curriculum is the recommended curriculum for all schools in, in Queensland. Can I say that the Respectful Relationships course Probably 90% of it is actually okay because it is trying to get people, and of course respectful relationships, which one of us do not want respectful relationships? But there's quite a, a, a lot in the respectful relationships course as well that is confusing our children, teaching them that they can choose if they want to be a boy or a girl, that when they wake up in the morning they might feel like a girl, when they get to lunch and they eat like a Viking, they might feel like more, more like a boy, and that's quite okay because you're on a spectrum and you've actually changed during the day. And that's the sort of rubbish that our kids are actually being taught in the gender fluid ideology. So it might sound like I've got a bit of a hobby horse here and you'd be right. Um, so this is the, why it's so important when the question is, you know, what about government interfering in, in parents' lives? So the question is, are you for or against um, gender fluid ideology being taught in our Queensland schools? Um, and I'll just see who would like to answer that one first. Thanks, Glenn. Here it is here. Education policy, we're fully against it. No gender bending in schools, full stop. Uh, you, you can come and see it afterwards. We're going to bring, if we're elected, competition back to the classrooms. 
So no more, everybody's a winner. There are losers in life, get over it. That's all I can say on that matter. But uh, also, um, yeah, science, English and maths will be coming back if One Nation are elected. Okay, who'd like to go next, Kira Lee? So the LNP has called out programs like the gender, bed, gender bread person program, which, which has been banned in New South Wales, and we would ban that here as well. So one of our sort of big policies to, is to declutter the curriculum. If you know a teacher, I know a lot of teachers, they work just ridiculously hard trying to teach our children because there's so much going on in schools today that is not about foundational learning. So we want kids to be able to learn about English, maths and science at school and for teachers to be able to focus on those foundational things. And in my view, the other stuff is the kind of thing that should be discussed at home by families. Parents need to guide their children through growth, development and and questions like uh, their gender, which is not actually a question at all. Is there anyone else who'd like to comment on that? I think we were talking about debt before. This book, it's an old book, it's time they knew. You probably haven't seen it and you may not have a copy. I don't think you can even buy it. It was later written called The Money Trick. Explains how banks work. A bank on average back then were lending nine times as much money as they actually had in deposits. So they okay. were lending something they didn't have themselves. Consequence Thanks. today, that's a replica of some Zimbabwe money, $100 trillion. Thanks, Ian. We'll, we'll move on from that. But if anybody would like to come and see his book later, do that. Is there anyone else who'd like to comment on the education in schools? I can't say it any better than what Kira Lee did. Okay, so. yep. Judy, did you want to comment? No. Can I just say that not one of us here would want any child bullied at school, and of course we want everybody to be respectful. So when we talk about safe schools, of course we want our schools to be safe, and no, no single child should be bullied, but neither do we want children in kindergarten who favour one dress-up box over another to be somehow put on a pathway of transition, even in kindergarten, it's madness. So, look, I think we've just about come to the end of the night because I've, I'm getting close to time to pray and um, close. But uh, there have been a lot of other um, questions that have come in, particularly about... Uh, well, there's one here to the minor parties that might be a good... Oh, it might be a tricky one. I don't always read them before I ask. But to the minor party candidates, to which party should your voters give their second preference? So it's talking about preferences. Um, so, yeah, OK. Everybody owns their own preference. Yes, I agree with that. Put the one in the box who you want and then it's up to you wherever you want to put the box. But make sure you mark every box from one to whatever it is, otherwise it will become non-valid. Thanks, Kira Lee. Um, yes. Oh, Judy, sorry. It is, <laughs> it is the voter's choice. You do your research, you look at the parties, you, like Lane said, yes, you number one to seven in this case. Um, nobody else can recommend preferential voting but you. Thank you. I'm just going to end on a comment um, here. Uh, it's sort of a question as well, but um, thanks for those um, answers. Oh, did you want to say anything about that, Ian? No, you're good? Okay. Um, I've always been an LNP supporter. It's disheartening to see that this, there has been an increase in um, talking negatively of leaders. In light of Romans 13, which encourages Saul that leaders are ultimately placed there by God and we're called to honour their position. And so the question is, uh, moving forward, will we, will we try to bring unity to the nation? And I think um, that's a good way to sort of finish on the night. I don't know whether anybody would like to discuss, just comment about that, about um, the, the, how are you going with your campaigns? Is, are you finding that they're negative? Are you, are you doing okay? Because it can be quite confronting doing a campaign, so. <laughs> I didn't watch last night's debate. No, was it ugly, was it? 
Okay, the question, they're talking amongst themselves now, that's quite rude, isn't it, really? <laughs> um, one or the other. Oh. So, sorry, it was it was uh, myself, Kira Lee, Judy, and uh, Mick De Brenny, and it was the uh, Courier Mail um, debate. It wasn't really, in my opinion, a debate because there was different questions asked of different candidates rather than one question uh, at the start for all on different uh, aspects. Right. So it's more of a Q and A. Okay. But just in answer to the question, yes. well, obviously... Every you know, time Janet opens her mouth, we interrupt. So it's OK. Just no, keep your mouth your open there, Janet. It's fine. Kira Lee, go. No, I'm only joking. Well, you know, to, I don't usually quote the Bible, Bible at political meetings, but we all know the Bible says, without a vision, the people perish. We can't continue with the negativity that's just breeding in our, in our state. We, we need a positive vision. We need positive choices and positive actions to move forward. There may be a pandemic. Yes, there is an unemployment crisis. What are we going to do about it? What, what vision can we come together around? And we need leaders who can put forward a vision and bring our communities together. I think that uh, as a society, we really allow differences to divide us. And if we can be brave enough if we allow differences to bring a breadth and a depth of understanding of who we are as human beings, but also to bring respect back, to bring kindness back, to bring honour back, and to bring a sense of unity because we are all humans and we all want to build a better future. Now, we're going to have different opinions, we're going to have different policies, we're going to come from different perspectives. But I think that Queenslanders, I think that Australians deserve better than having uh, a, a constant negativity. And I think particularly in this season, we've seen uh, so much fear mongering, we've seen so much uh, devastation. And, and I'm, I am significantly concerned around, as I've said tonight, the mental health of our people. I'm proud to be a part of a team that has a vision and a plan for the future. I'm proud to be a part of a team that is going to take our, our state and rebuild it. I'm proud to serve under Deb Frecklington and I'm proud to be a part of a team that has colleagues like Kira Lee here, uh, like Mark and like so many other good, good people uh, who have got a vision and a plan and who are ready to move forward because we have not just this generation but the generations to come who are waiting on us to move forward with vision, as Kira Lee said but also with respect and with a sense of dignity and a sense of integrity. Uh, so I think that that's a very important part of moving forward. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. Um, I'm finding this is my very first campaign. I'm totally new to it. Um, I'm finding people are really appreciating me being real with them. Um, people are actually quite shocked at some of the things that I've been, I've been showing them. Um, our campaign is to vote for a kinder Queensland, which is kindness towards each other as human beings, towards our, our country, towards our planet, our environment, and also towards our animals. Like I said before, our aim is to coexist peacefully with each other, not to abuse one and not the other. So good. Thank you. Can I just... Um, yeah, it's really good. Um, one of these, two of these people may be your member after 31st of October um, from Springwood or Mansfield. Um, they may not, so it might be someone else. But whoever is elected, can I just really encourage us to get behind that person? And our elected candidates, our elected members need to know that we are, are interested, they need to know that we care. They need to know when we're, when we're sad about things, but they also need to be encouraged. Um, and so with that, we will pray for our elected members now. Um, but also, can I just say that if there's a candidate up here that has impressed you tonight and you feel like, I would really like to support that person, can I encourage you to do that between now and the 31st of October? They will be starting on pre-polling on the 19th. Um, and so they have to man a pre-poll, like if they've got two in their electorate or three, however many. How many do you have in your electorate? 
two. So two pre-polling um, places, they have to man that from very early to quite late. There's extended hours because of COVID. So if you can help, if you, there's someone up here you think, I'd really like to help that person, I know that they would really appreciate that. Dave, is there anything else that you'd like to say at the end? No. So can I just thank you all very much for being here and also anybody on the um, live stream, thank you so much for being there and participating as well. We really appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to pray. Take the time to come up and, and shake their hands and thank them, but I'm very grateful to you for being here and for being interested in what is probably, in my mind, one of the most important elections we've ever faced in Queensland. So let's pray now. Father God, we thank you for a really interesting night. We thank you that we've been able to hear from fellow Queenslanders who have a passion in their heart and they're prepared to stand up and say, I'm prepared to lead. And we're grateful for that, Lord. We thank you for our nation. We thank you for our Prime Minister. We thank you for our Premier. And Lord, we thank you for um, the relative safety that we are experiencing and relative prosperity. Even though there are many who are suffering, when we look around the globe, we realise how blessed we really are. Father, there are many things that concern us. There are many things that break our hearts. And Lord, you have called us to be carers for the vulnerable. You have called us to be carers of our world. You have called us to be carers of the unborn. You have called us to be people who are kind. Uh, but you have also called us to be people of the truth. And I pray that you will give us wisdom and grace and strength and even bravery to be able to speak more and more the truth in our public spaces because you have said that righteousness exalts a nation and that's what we want to see. We want, our, we want to see our nation um, becoming more prosperous and more focused on what is true and right and good for our next generation. So we commit the night to you. I pray for each of these candidates. I pray that you'll protect them as they go through very busy time and that you will be ultimately in control of who is elected at this election. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Everybody.